let's take a look at limits and the continuity of uh, functions of two variables. Now, with functions of one variable, such as you've encountered in Calc 1, how did you check if something had a limit? Well, you would check for the left limit, okay? That's the left limit. You would check the right limit, and you would check that the uh, two limits were equal, and then you know that a limit would exist uh, over there. And uh, you had that a function was continuous when the function equaled its limit. Uh, so you could see here, it's uh, as a kind of recap of Calc 1, uh, at A, our left limit is this, you know, this value of y over here. And our, uh, on the other hand, our right limit is this value here. Those two are not equal, and hence uh, this function does not have a limit at A. But it does have a, a limit at B. You could go from the uh, right or from the left, and those two are equal. So, you know, the uh, point at B, we have a limit. The point at A, it does not exist. This D and E means does not exist. Now, how do you do this with functions of two variables? I mean, it's not left or right anymore. I mean, a point lives in a plane. So you could approach this point in many different directions, and not only in many different directions, but in many different ways. You could loop around and then come in at a certain direction. Uh, you could come in parabolically. You could come in a straight line. Uh, so uh, it's not merely now a left and right issue. Uh, you could come in at many different directions. Uh, to define our limit in, in for two uh, functions of two variables, we have that a limit L, and we write that uh, the limit of f of xy as xy approaches AB, so as you approach the fixed point AB, uh, is equal to L. We never, for any given epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists some delta such that f of x is uh, uh, close to L whenever x, the point xy, is close to the point AB, okay? So here we say we just choose any epsilon. We could get as close to L as we want, but in order to be close to L, this, epsilon, this um, delta depends on epsilon. So we have to be uh, close enough to the point in order for f to be close to its limit, okay? This is called a delta epsilon definition. It's also true of functions of one variable, although when you're dealing with functions of one variable, generally you talk about it in terms of left and right. Here we don't have that luxury because of the problem of uh, many different paths, okay? Uh, but the how we work with continuous functions is similar to the past in the sense that when the limit of f of xy as xy approaches ab when that limit exists and when f is defined at, at ab and when those two are equal the limit and the function then your function is continuous so that is similar to the calc one although limits we can't just talk about it in terms of left and right so just to clarify our delta epsilon definitions so here is the limit L. You see the limit L. It's on the Z axis. And uh, epsilon is the, you know, distance away from L that we could be. If we want, if we make, so epsilon could be any number greater than zero. So we could make it very small. And as long as we could continue to find some delta there, which is kind of the radius of the uh, pink circle you see, so that for any epsilon, if we could find a delta, that if we stay within uh, that pink circle, then the function will stay within the bounds of L from, you know, stay within L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon, then uh, we say that the limit exists and that the function's limit is equal to L. And again, we could just sh shrink epsilon, and we could find the corresponding uh, uh, delta, okay? And we could make epsilon as small as we want.
Okay, so we could get ever closer to L as long as we stay near the point AB. That's when the limit exists. We could also vary A and B around. Okay, so here's a different uh, point A and B. Uh, and X and Y should approach A and B so that it's if it's within that um, uh, red, you know, pink circle there, then you will be within uh, the uh, uh, bounds uh, around L, L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon. All right, so let's now compute a uh, limit. So let's find the limit of this function here uh, at 2, 8, at the point 2, 8. Now, this function that you see here is a polynomial and it's continuous, okay? Uh, so we could basically find the limit in the similar way that you've done in calculus where you just plug in the value, okay? There's no problems there. Uh, so the limit of fxy as xy goes to 2, 8, Wherever I see an x, I'll plug in my 2. Wherever I see a y, I'll plug in the 8. And this is the value that you get, and it's 100. Now, of course, we could do this because it is continuous. And we knew it was continuous because it was a polynomial. Okay? Sometimes uh, that you don't have that luxury. You don't know that it's continuous ahead of time. Uh, but here we knew, and then because it's continuous, we could use this fact that all we have to do is just plug in a, b to get the the uh, limit. On the other hand, we could deal with discon discontinuities, okay? So recall here from, you know, a calc 1 example, if you have the function given x squared minus 4 over x minus 2, we you know, this x minus 2, we can't plug in 2 into this function. You have a discontinuity because you're not allowed to have 0. You're not allowed to divide by 0. So this leaves a hole in the function that you see here. Nevertheless, the limit exists. I mean, if approaching from the left or the right, uh, even though the function is discontinuous, the limit will equal 4. And you could see that mathematically, you know, algebraically by factoring this x squared minus 4, it factors to x plus 2 and x minus 2. The x minus 2's cancel, and so you're left with uh, x plus 2, and you could then just plug in the 2 and get 4. Graphically, you could see why this works, because there's only just a hole, okay? And uh, that does not mean the, the limit stops existing if there's a discontinuity. Uh, and so we could get similar situations here, with functions of two variables so that we could still have a limit even if there is a discon discontinuity. So in particular, let's take a look at the limit of fxy defined this way at 1, 1. Now, if you try to plug in that point 1, 1 in the denominator, you're going to get 0, much in the similar way that we had up here, plugging in 2. So we can't just plug in 1, 1. What, what we can do is try to factor out the top and somehow get rid of this offending term at the bottom. So factoring out the top, we could factor it into x plus y and x minus y. The x minus y's will cancel, and then you're left with x plus y. And although there was a discontinuity at 1, 1, in fact, there's a discontinuity everywhere where x equals y, because x minus y would then turn out to be 0 we still get that the limit is equal to 2 in a very similar way that we had a uh, that we had in our calc 1 example and note that the discontinuity up here the discontinuity is at one point the point x equals 2 here our discontinuity is the whole line x equals y i mean you don't want to to have uh, uh, x minus y being equal to 0 and x minus y equals 0 when x equals y. So you get a whole discon discontinuity at the uh, line x equals y. You don't have a discontinuous whole, you have a discontinuous line. Nevertheless, as we approach that discontinuous line, we can still get a limit 
in much the same way that we can still get a limit when we approach the discontinuous hole. So here's our function that we uh, looked at, x squared minus y squared all over x minus y. And uh, you could see that you have this whole, you know, that white line in there is the excluded line. Very similar to having a hole in the uh, function of one variable. Here we have a whole excluded line. But even with the excluded line, we could still approach that line and get a limit. So at 1, 1, we, uh, uh, we found that the limit was 2, which means the z value at 1, 1, even though it's excluded, was uh, equal to uh, 2. Okay, So we still have a limit uh, everywhere uh, in, in the plane there, despite the discontinuity, in much the same way that we had uh, a limit despite the discontinuous point for our Calc 1 example. And also something else to note is that this plane is actually the x plus y plane. So if you just drew out the plane there, it would be the graph of the function x plus y. And uh, we, we saw that, you know, it's, it's the graph of the function x plus y, but without that line. Okay. And that's because the numerator could be factored into x plus y times x minus y. And so the x minus y's could cancel the artifact of having that x minus y at the bottom then was just to leave a hole uh, or, or rather a, a line of holes if you will uh, along the uh, graph of the function and recall here that we're also leaving a hole so we have a similar situation dividing by x minus 2 it just left that one hole over there okay but if you want to look at this line this line looks pretty much like x plus 2, just missing the whole. That was the artifact of dividing by x minus 2. So then, how can we show that a function doesn't have a limit? And if it doesn't have a limit, it's also discontinuous. Uh, so how can we do that? We could do that using the two-path test. The two-path test let's us show that a limit does not exist and so what can we do we approach a point a b along two different paths now if we could show that approaching along two different paths gives us two different numbers then we know the limit does not exist the analog to calc one is the idea of approaching from the left and approaching from the right and showing it doesn't exist here our approach isn't just merely from the right and left. It's You could approach from right, left, up, down. Even if you approach from one direction, you could approach in a different way. Okay, so that makes a difference. Uh, let's take a concrete example here and show that this function defined this way, so it's defined to be zero at the origin, and uh, otherwise it's defined uh, as this. Uh, we want to show that it's discontinuous at 0, 0. And we'll show it's discontinuous by showing that the limit does not exist. How will we show that the limit does not exist? We'll approach along two different paths, okay, and get two different values for the limit. So what we'll do then is approach the origin different ways and show that we get different values. The paths we're going to take are these, okay? Uh, x of t will be equal to mt squared, and y of t will be equal to uh, just t. Another way to see that is, you know, if x equals mt squared and y is equal to t, well then, instead of the t up here, why don't we just plug in y? Okay, and what is that? That's the uh, parabolic paths that you're seeing here, okay? And m is just a constant. We're just going to take it to be some constant, which will, you know, allow us to approach from 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 uh, different paths in an easy way. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So if r is this path that we take towards the origin, then we're going to plug in our r into our function. How do we plug it in? Well, we have a function of two variables. We'll take our x of t and plug it into x. We'll take our y of t and plug it into y. So 
uh, you could, you know, we'll use this notation for plugging in a path into a function. So the limit as x, y approaches 0 is the same as t going to 0 of f with the path plugged in. Why do I say it's the same? Well, as t goes to 0, plug in 0 into this. It's 0, 0. So you are at the origin when t goes to 0. So it's a way of approaching the origin on these parabolic paths. Uh, I also write it this way. So this is the same thing as just plugging in the path. Uh, instead of an x, we have an x of t to signify that we're actually on a particular path. And uh, instead of the x that you see here and the y that you see here. And remember, away from the origin, this is what we have. And we're approaching the origin, so we're not at the origin. So we use that uh, function there. And, you know, wherever there's a y, I wrote y of t there. And now what's the next step? The next step is to plug in our x and t's and y's in, in, in y of t x of t is mt squared, y of t is t. You see it also down here. And uh, we could simplify this. Okay, we get this when we simplify. Notice we have a t to the power of 4 in the denominator and numerator. And we could factor out the t to the power of 4 and divide it, and we get this value here, okay? This is the limit as xy approaches 0, 0 along parabolas that look like this, okay, with this particular m. Now, let's go along the parabola where m equals 1. Along the parabola where m equals 1, this is how the parabola actually looks. It's in green. So where as t goes to 0, what you're doing is starting out here and then approaching the origin this way. That's for m equals 1 in green there. And the value that we get is 3 halves for the limit. Now, what about the parabola with m equals 2, which looks like this blue parabola that you see there? Well, approaching the origin from this path, we get 6 fifths. Okay? And 6 fifths is not equal to 3 halves. So, we approaching along the green, we get 3 halves. Appro approaching along the blue, we get 6 halves. 3 halves does not equal 6, six uh, fifths, so we then know that the limit does not exist. We get two different values, 3 halves and 6 fifths, uh, uh, approaching from different directions. And by the two path tests, because we got two different values from two different paths, we know that the uh, limit does not exist. And uh, now you're probably wondering, well, okay, that's nice, but how did you know to use that path? Frankly, I've done this problem before. So in hindsight, I knew that was the path that I had to choose. Yeah, but we there's a motivation for it, okay? That motivation is what's important, and it's that I was able to get t to the fourth factored out, okay? If you would have chosen m times t instead of t squared, which, what does that mean? That means you're approaching from straight lines instead of parabolic lines. Then you would have ended up with a m times t times t squared. That's m t cubed in the top. And at the bottom here, you would get m t squared plus uh, t to the fourth. And so you wouldn't have gotten these nice, you know, way to factor out t fourths. So the, the formula that I needed there was to have this be squared. And notice that in the numerator there, y has a power twice as much as the power of 1. In the denominator, y also has a power twice as much as the power of uh, the uh, power uh, of x. Okay, So here's 4 and 2. That's twice as much. So 4 is twice as much as 2. And 2 and 1, and 2 is twice as much as 1. So I knew that I, if I could uh, double the power of x relative to y in the path, then I could, you know, get a common power of 4 in the top and bottom there. Okay? And that allowed me to cancel out the t's and get this finite amount uh, as t goes to uh, 0. And the rest was plugging in different values of m and showing that you would get different uh, uh, values, okay? And again, different values of m corresponds to different paths, okay? 
So uh, we could have, did we have to choose M equals 1 and M equals 2? No. We could have even chosen M equals 0. And what is M equals 0 there? Think about what M equals 0. If M equals 0, then you're approaching from the y-axis, actually. So if you approached with M equals 0, then the limit along the y-axis would be 0, which is different than 3 halves or 6 fifths. So that's yet another path that gives us a different value uh, as we approach the origin. And uh, so we know this limit should not exist. So if you want to see how this function actually looks, the one we were you know, discussing, here it is. This is the uh, function. And uh, what you see in green there is the path with m equals 1. Here's the path with m equals 0. You notice we're just going along the uh, y-axis in that case. That's the path with m equals 0. We could have even chosen m equals uh, minus 1, which would be uh, this green path there. In that green path along the, the, the graph of the function is the blue path. Okay, Here's the m equals 0. We found that the function was 0 if you approach along that path. And uh, the m equals 1 is the green path, right, on the xy plane. Because these are, these are paths on the xy plane. But uh, taking that path up to the function, so mapping that function, so f of the uh, path, the green path, is the blue path that you see there. And you could see that we were getting a different limit. So this, this is why a function like this would not have a limit since uh, approaching from different paths gives you uh, different values of the limit. Incidentally, if you try to approach the origin along straight lines, so if the only paths you were looking at were straight lines, you would get zero everywhere. Okay, So here it was actually important to uh, take a parabolic path.